Can you hear me? Can I be heard? Oh, man. I think they're going to turn it up. There we okay, go. We there we, we go. Good, 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 good. good. Yeah. Happy Sabbath, man. It's good seeing you today. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, I I'm wearing this uh, mask. It's a different kind of a mask. I see it. Um, it, was, it was made especially with Emmanuel Brinklow. Yeah. Uh, name the on the front of it. Yeah, Marlene McCraw from Las Vegas sent it to me. I'm loving it. And uh, it also has filters built in it. So I'm just modeling today. I, I don't know if it looks good, but I I'm like just... It. I'm, I'm just like modeling. It, it has a little little side pocket it's that opens up okay. that you can talk, you know. <laughs> I don't know what that's about, but uh, yeah. uh, we're just breaking out with different styles yeah. of masks. You never know what here. we're going to come for. You never with, know, uh, never know. Yeah. So we're just excited to be here today. Um, didn't we have a great time last night in communion? What an, ama what an amazing word from Dr. Prairie. That Amen. was a word. I'm still yeah, yeah. riding high off of that spiritual food last night. We had a incredible time. Thank you for joining us last night. What an amazing uh, experience that we had. And uh, I'm just excited to be here and what God has been doing in this This Is a series. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It was a profound uh, communion service last yeah. night. We had many individuals to join us. Yeah. And uh, as we talked about earlier, Doc Crary walked through that, that, that oh, yes. presentation. He slow walked that he thing. He slow walked that thing. It if was you powerful. miss yeah. communion, you miss a wonderful blessing and treat that the Lord had prepared for us, and oftentimes you don't know what God has in store for you until you get to where uh, God has you to be. So what a wonderful experience we had last night. Yes, yes. I also want to transition and talk about uh, an important event tomorrow that's taking yes. place. Uh, you know, Grocery Grab and Go is taking place again on tomorrow. Thank you for our volunteers and, and our team that shows up every two weeks. They're always there. We always need uh, more men to join the women. Uh, especially the early timelines, um, the setup, you know, that's six and seven, yeah. uh, eight o'clock in the morning. Right. Uh, so if you will continue to uh, uh, go online, see where the information is, volunteer, yes. sign up, yes. uh, it is a blessing and we thank you. So we just want to remind you that Grocery Grab and Go will take place tomorrow. again on tomorrow. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Also, if you are a parent of a child that's in Adventist high school, uh, boarding high school, college. Mm -hmm. um, I know some of y'all, you, you have a seven-year-old, but they're not yet ready to leave. You got to hang on yet a little <laughs> while longer. But if you are interested, the three-way scholarships are available. We need those uh, completed and turned back into the office to our church administrative assistant by October the 5th. Yes. And so if you need them, please call the church office and get your uh, three-way scholarship application today. Uh, that your child may be blessed uh, financially and go on their build uh, yes. for, the, for the school year. Yes, and just before we transition, uh, I just want to pause to uh, wish you happy birthday. Thank you, uh, thank uh, you, thank Pastor you. Pastor Washington celebrated his birthday this past Wednesday, I think it was. Thursday. Thursday, Thursday, Thursday. yes. On the 23rd. Yep. Uh, in fact, we've had so many people who've had birthdays in the month of September. So tell us a good month. It's a good month. It's yeah. a good month. And we know that uh, Sheldon's is coming up on the 28th. Yes. And, uh, we're, we're Sheldon Kennedy. His and wife's birthday. His was wife's birthday. birthday. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But but yours, yours was this past yes. Thursday. Yes, it was. And, and we just want to take a moment just to acknowledge your birthday. So, <laughs> Thank you. So I was thinking about that. What is the best way to acknowledge the birthday of Pastor, Dr. Pastor Noah Washington. There we go. Now, here's what I know. You know, you all, you all have seen him in videos before. Uh, and when he's in videos, uh, especially with young people, he's always on a basketball court. Yeah. You know, and he comes across as this legendary uh, urban baller. I can hoop. And, and he can hoop. Can hoop. He, he can hoop. So, so I was trying to find out, well, you know, in the DMV, uh, where you were a star, Okay. And, and, and uh, you know, I, I searched high and low and couldn't find nobody. 
Uh, I couldn't find anybody in any of the um, playgrounds, any of the parks that recognize your skill sets. And I was like, wait a minute, but I know he's a ball player. I am. I know he's a ball player. And, uh, you know, word on the street, he may even had NBA aspirations one day. I don't, I don't know what it was. So I was trying to figure out where it was that he stood as a basketball legend. Uh, it's not in the NBA. And uh, it's not. Lord, Lord uh, called me. Lord okay, called me. I, so I, I couldn't I left find that alone. it. I couldn't even find anything in the streets of D.C. or uh, any place in the DMV. I even tried to check uh, Prince George's County that produces so many profound ball players. Something in the water. And, and, and so I was like, well, where is Dr. Washington, a basketball legend? Then it dawned on me. Okay. Let me, let me show you. I got you something. All right. Okay, it ain't wrapped. Y'all pray for your pastor. Okay. Uh, it's, it's not wrapped. Please. But Please, I, I, I beg of you. I, I beg of you to pray for him. He's a basketball legend in the Kitty League. And, and so, on behalf of your church, we acknowledge your legendary basketball skills. Not in the NBA, not even in the streets of D.C., but where you really master basketball is in the Kitty League basketball. So, on behalf of the church, we recognize your Kitty League basketball skills. May God bless you as you continue to enjoy the rest of your basketball I, I want to say history. thank you uh, on behalf of me and my family. From, uh, you know, your pastor just celebrated a birthday a couple of weeks ago, and um, he turned 95. And, you know, when people get up in age, they start forgetting and, and their mind goes. So uh, we want to intercede particularly for our pastor. Uh, uh, there's much I can say, but I'm trying to keep it holy today on the Lord's Sabbath day. And so uh, thank you so much. It's just good to be alive. I tell you, last year this time, I wasn't even walking much. I was laid up in my bed. And so I am just thankful uh, to be in good health this year. And the Lord has uh, blessed us um, so much. And so we praise God for this season of our lives. Before we press on, I want to know if there's anyone who has a prayer request, uh, something they want or need the Lord to do in their life. If you can just put it in the chat, uh, you need God's blessings on your life, in school, on your job, in your health, whatever the case may be. How many knows that God hears and answers prayer? Come on, throw something in the chat. How many know God hears, but he also answers prayer? Would you pray with me? Oh God, our Father, what an amazing God we are that as your children we can come to you and ask things according to your will. And the Bible lets us know that in no wise will you cast us out. We are grateful that in this season where there has been so much death and dis-ease and distraction and destruction that you have kept us in our right mind. Thank you, God, for being the keeper and being the keeper of our soul. Thank you, God, that you have um, been good to us, even in bad times. Thank you for just the way that you have been letting us know that you still care, even in this difficult time. And so, God, we pray for healing on the earth once again. That in the, for the four corners of this wor uh, world, those that are struggling with this virus, and God, with other diseases that they had even before this pandemic started. Touch your children over the four corners of the, of the earth. Those that have put in the chat that they need healing for themselves or for loved ones and for friends, God, we pray that by your spirit you would touch them in the name of Jesus. God, would you touch our brothers and sisters, continue to bless them and touch them in Afghanistan, God. The, the unrest and the uh, uh, dis-ease and frustration and, 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 and difficulty there, God, touched the land in Afghanistan. And then, God, our, our minds were troubled and hearts broken as we have been watching this week the difficulties with our brothers and sisters from Haiti. Father, touch our Haitian brothers and sisters right now, God. They're in need of a touch from heaven. They're in need of your hand. 
I don't know, God, how much longer we can take of all of this. In fact, your word even says in Revelation, oh, Lord, how long their souls crying under the altar. And so, God, we pray for peace of mind and for peace of spirit and for grace and for faith to trust you more. And as you're soon to come, I pray that our relationship with you would grow stronger each and every day is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. story about two men. But when two men walked on water in the Bible, it is in Matthew chapter 14 verses 22 through 33. The disciples were tired because they had a long bit because they just had a long day of teaching. So they decided to go out to the sea and sail across to the other side. When they were on the sea, they saw this figure in the distance and they were wondering, what was the figure? The figure, it was Jesus. But the disciples didn't know that. They thought it was a ghost, and they got scared. They were very frightened. But then Jesus told them to not be afraid. But Peter was like, is that really Jesus? Cause it's, and then he asked Jesus, Jesus, if it's really you, you tell me to come and walk on water. And, the, and Jesus said, come. So Peter came out of the boat and walked to Jesus. And he didn't sink. He didn't sink because he was focused on Jesus and he put all his faith in him. But when What's he took his eyes, faith means you trust in Jesus and you, well, you're kind of like, you rely on him to do what's best for you. So, but when he took his eyes off of Jesus and he looked away, he got scared and he started to sink because he took his faith and he didn't trust in Jesus. And then he, and he said, what well, probably the shortest prayer in the Bible, Lord, help me. And the Lord helped him and grabbed him and put him and put him back in the boat. When they caught the boat, all the disciples worshipped Jesus. This story tells us to put all of our trust and faith in Jesus. All, all the time, no matter what. Would you like to pray for me, Zia?
Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but I have a total praise this morning. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify. Uh-huh. Magn- uh, I mean, I know there's only a couple of us in here, but magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together because the Lord is what? He's good and his mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. I don't know about you, but if you've got a total praise, I want you to put it in the chat right now. I just want to give God total praise. This week we have been talking about, or or remembering rather, the sacrifice that the Lord has done for us. And so in light of that, Within our theme, we are talking about this is us, and I was given the task of talking about forgiveness. And so I'd like to ask that you turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Luke, Gospel of Luke, chapter 23, and verse 34. It's one verse today, Luke chapter 23. Verse 34, and the Bible says, then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. This morning, the message is simply entitled, A God That Forgives, A God That Forgives. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we just acknowledge that your presence is already here. And right now, God, we just ask that you fill us in this moment, that you lead and guide us into all truth, that we might know something more about you in this moment. It's in Jesus' name I pray this. Amen. Now, a few weeks back, if you remember, Doc Medley provided a detailed synopsis of the hit television series, This Is Us. A show that explores the complexities of the human experience, thus uh, 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 nuancing the actions of every individual in the story by revealing the deep layers that complicate them and therefore complicate the things they may have uh, said or done. This Is Us is a show that highlights just how little we ever know about a person Or a situation. By providing this kind of detailed backstory for every character every week, we as viewers get the opportunity to understand the feelings and the rationale behind why a character said or did whatever they did. This prevents viewers from ever assigning any character in the show the role of villain because there's always a nuanced reason for someone's behavior. See, every fight, every word spoken in jealousy, every side eye, every compliment, every omitted narrative, and even the stories that are told can all be attached to a series of events. A chain reaction of behaviors that humanize the brokenness of every person. It is this window into the depths of humanity's brokenness and our inability to avoid it that forces the viewer to declare this is us. This is our family. This is our marriage. This is our relationship. This is our trigger. This is our baggage. This is our grief. This is Our avoidance, our deflecting, isolating, impulsive, sadness, selfish, jealousy, addicted, anxious, OCD, depressive, suicidal, joyful, disappointed behavior. This is us. We are the sum total of everything that has ever happened to us. Everything that happens around us. Even the things that happen to people that are connected to us. And it is this reality that... When put into the context of various characters' behaviors on the show, stretches both the character and the viewer to not wallow in bitterness, but instead opens themselves up to the possibility, Noah, that what happened to you.
you might have less to do with you and more to do with the feelings, the experiences, and the needs of the other person. From this perspective, some of your greatest pain thus came not by malice intent, but was instead the result of you being an innocent casualty of the mushroom cloud of their own explosion, an unintended target in the aftershock of their own destruction. See, we see this play out between multiple characters in the show, but most significantly between Randall, the black adopted son played by Sterling K. Brown, and Rebecca, the white mother, played by Mandy Moore. Now, initially, Doc Melly, we are drawn into the narrative of a young black boy abandoned at a hospital and rescued by a white family who went in to have triplets only for one of the babies to die. Doc Melly told us about this story. See, at the height of, of their grief, this family decides that they're going to embrace a new baby, a baby that was abandoned at this hospital. And this all comes to a head one Thanksgiving when Randall has found his biological father, an old man living in a really run-down, substandard living apartment complex. Randall takes his father in to live with him. And as they are sitting around the table, Randall has to confront his mother because he is angry. And I mean, he is upset, Kimba. And he just does not care that his children are sitting at the table right now because he is bothered. And basically what he realizes is when he went to his father's apartment to pick up a box of some of his things, he found in the card, in the box, a card from his mama with his picture in the box. This is us. And so what we're seeing is that Randall, who was told that he didn't know who his father was and his mama didn't know who his father was and nobody knew where he could get in contact with any of his family, all of a sudden, for some odd reason, there's a letter in this man's house with a picture of him as a child. Randall is distraught. Yes, you might be wondering why. Why is he this angry at Rebecca? Going off on the woman who for over 30 years has poured into and raised him and financially supported him. Why are you, why are you going off on her? The fact of the matter is, is that there are many things that go into the decisions that we make. And so while we see Randall's hurt, we actually then take a trip in the show to see Rebecca's decision making. See, Rebecca knew that Randall's biological father at that time was struggling with a debilitating drug and alcohol addiction. And so when she went to meet with him when Randall was still a baby and they had a conversation, the conversation consisted of stay away from Randall because, see, you're not good for Randall. And what, while this is infuriating to Randall, what he's possibly not understanding is what was going on in Rebecca's world that would cause her to make that kind of decision. See, Randall believed the woman who took him in, the woman he trusted, the woman he called mom, maliciously kept his father from him. But see, it's easy to stay on this wagon with Randall and become angry and resentful and determined that Randall is better off without Rebecca being in his life. But see, then the camera pans, Pastor Washington, and as she's crying, the viewer is taken on a journey back to her in that moment. And you see a woman who is in deep pain, reeling from the death of a child stillborn. She's wrestling with the images of having three cribs in her home, three bottles, three pacifiers, three blankets, three teddy bears, three of everything, and now can only bring home two babies. 
devastated, her husband Jack makes a proposition to her that while it took her a little bit to receive, they then decide they're going to accept this baby. So that when Rebecca finds Randall's father and she's confronted with a man whose lifestyle and quality of life could kill her baby, either socially, physically, or emotionally, if this man ever had contact with her new son, then you see a little bit better why she made the decision that she made. See, she decided that it was best for Randall not to know his father. She determined in her heart that she'd never lose another baby again. And from that place, that place of deep grief, that place of fear and anxiety where she is ultimately inflicting a wound on her son that would have her lose the very baby she tried to keep as an adult in that moment Rebecca did not know the ramifications of her action she did not know how growing up in a white family with no connection to any black family negatively impacted Randall she did not know how he envisioned the black librarian as his mother and the black meteorologist as his father because they were the only two consistent black people he ever saw she did not know that even with the greatest of intentions that her act of love, her act of justice even, was destructive. In fact, her ignorance to her own brokenness prevented her from being able to see how any decision made from a place of grief and fear only produces death. See, in Randall, it produced the death of identity, the death of relationships, the death of personhood, the death of racial understanding, and ultimately the death of trust. And this morning's biblical This Is Us narrative opens with death. Jesus is physically dying on a gruesome and torturous cross, and at the height of his pain, he declares, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. A powerful statement. This clause is only mentioned, Doc Medley, in the Gospel of Luke. In fact, Leon Morris in his book, Luke, an introduction and commentary, writes of this text, quote, there is textual doubt about this prayer. It is absent from many of the best manuscripts and some critics argue that it must be rejected since it would scarcely have been omitted if genuine. But against this is the fact that other very good manuscripts do attest it, end quote. In other words, there are early manuscripts that include the saying and there are early manuscripts that exclude it. And while its textual presence is in question, I believe that we can trust that Jesus did in fact utter these words because Luke also wrote the book of Acts. Now in the book of Acts chapter 7 and verse 60, Luke records the final words of Stephen while he's being stoned. And the Bible says, then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he said this, he fell asleep. A, a, a similar prayer in a similar moment, as readers, we cannot ignore this literary parallel. See, while Stephen does not repeat word for word, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, the phrase, do not charge them with this sin, carries the same meaning. In fact, the phrases are not, the fact that the phrases are not identical speaks, in my opinion, to an even greater plausibility that Jesus, in fact, uttered this prayer and Stephen, remembering the words and the sentiment of his teacher and savior, declares a similar prayer. The reason this prayer is so critical to the story of Jesus and our understanding of forgiveness is because this one line, in this one line, Jesus asks God to give us a peek into the backstory of his executioners. Accused and convict, convicted by the religious leaders and nailed by Roman guards, Jesus' death 
is inextricably linked to a critical historical moment for this generation of Hebrews. What is critical for us to remember is that for approximately 400 years, God has been silent. He has sent no prophets. He has spoken no words. At this point, the Jews are moving from occupation to occupation, holding on to promises of prophets like Isaiah, who declare that a Messiah will come and that the government shall be upon his shoulders and he will avenge the Israelites for all of their oppression. So committed to their idea of the Messiah so emotionally attached to their interpretation of what the Messiah would do and how he would act, the Bible says that he was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. See, we are reeling. They are reeling from centuries of systemic oppression at the hands of government powers, uh, grief-stricken over the systematic uh, economic and physical abuse of systems like Babylon and Rome. See, the Jews, they, de they dedicated themselves to a promise. They dedicated themselves to an image of God, an image of God, an image of Messiah that they had never seen so that when the true Messiah came, they could not separate themselves from the Messiah that they created in their own image. See, the Messiah they were waiting for was synagogue educated. The Messiah they were waiting for was born in Jerusalem. The Messiah they were waiting for was born to a happily married couple. The Messiah they were waiting for was dressed in fine linen. The Messiah they were waiting for upheld the Levitical and Deuteronomic code. The Messiah they were waiting for didn't speak to women. The Messiah they were waiting for didn't touch lepers. The Messiah they were waiting for looked nothing like Jesus. So that the moment Jesus uttered that he was the son of God, the moment Jesus declared he was the Messiah, they believed he was a blasphemer. They believed he was seeking to manipulate and exploit their community in the minds of the religious leaders. They did not crucify the Messiah. They crucified an influential teacher. They crucified a revolutionary healer. They crucified a system troubling leader. They crucified a lying Nazarene. They crucified a blasphemer. But the, what they didn't do was crucify the Messiah. They didn't crucify the Son of God in an attempt to do justly by their people, in an attempt to uphold the law of Moses, in an attempt to protect the very character and image of God, the religious leaders crucified the real Messiah because his character and his family and his clothes and his place of birth, his speech, his actions, nothing about him aligned with the Messiah they imagined. They did not know what they were doing. Ellen White in The Desire of Ages writes, quote, had they known that they were putting to torture one who had come to save the sinful race from eternal ruin, they would have been seized with remorse and horror, but their ignorance did not remove their guilt, unquote. Family, this is us. A church so committed to an image of God that we crucify the image of God. Family, this is us. Preachers so committed to performing the image of God that we crucify the power of God. This is us. Mothers so committed to maintaining the image of marriage that we crucify the abuse of God. This is us. Fathers so committed to expressing the image of strength that we crucify the children of God. This is us. Friends that are so committed to upholding the image of accuracy that we crucify the love of God. This is us, co-workers so committing to, co committed to upholding the image of truth that we 
crucify the humility of God. This is us, believers, so committed to upholding the image of holiness that we crucify the grace of God. And I don't know about you, but I'm just grateful this morning that God sees the brokenness behind my behavior and forgives me. Oh, do I have two or three people that understand what it means to be forgiven by a God that understands your backstory? Can I get somebody to just throw up the, the, the holy hands of praise in the chat right now? See, you are forgiven for the actions and the subsequent reactions. Forgiven for the lifestyle you lived because you were abused. Forgiven for the people you hurt because you were grieving. Forgiven for the people you neglected because you were never loved. Forgiven for all the lies you told because you were never accepted. Forgiven for all the beatings you inflicted on others because you were always in be being beaten. Forgiven for the ways you used people because you were never appreciated. Forgiven for all the times you gossiped because you're never being spoken highly of. Forgiven for all the sex you had because you were raped. Forgiven for the tests you cheated on because you were insecure. What's powerful about Jesus' final prayer is that God in Jesus reveals that God forgives our sin because he knows our story. Now, forgiveness is, is not a feeling. Forgiveness is an action. I like how one author puts it, Pastor Washington, J.E. Adams in his book, From Forgiven to Forgiving, writes that forgiving is not forgetting. See, to forget something is for a memory or a thought to passively leave your mind. You don't really have control over it. You forgot whatever the thing was. But Adam says, quote, not remembering is active. It's a promise whereby one person, in this case God, determines not to remember the sins of another against him. To not remember is simply a graphic way of saying, Doc Medley, I will not bring up these matters to you or others in the future. I will bury them and not exhume the bones to beat you over the head with. I will never use these sins against you. And how many people can testify that God has not brought back the things that you have done back to you in your prayer closet? That when you confess your sins and he declared that he was faithful and just to forgive you your sins and to cleanse you from all of your unrighteousness, that he never brought it back up the next time you went into devotion that he didn't hold it over your head because Jesus is not the accuser of the brethren. That is not what he's trying to do. And so what we've got to understand is that the cross in this moment with his last and final breath, Jesus pleads with the Father, God, bury the sin of the abuse towards me. Bury the sin of their rejection of me. Bury the sin of them spitting on me. Bury the sin of them mocking me. Bury the sin of them piercing my side. Bury the sin of this crown of thorns on my head. Bury the sin of this cross and do not bring these matters up to them in the future God. Do not exhume the bones of their fornication. God God, do not exhume the bones of their iniquity. God, do not exhume the bones of their exploitation. God, do not exhume the bones of their murderous hearts. God, do not exhume the bones of their sin. They do not know what they're doing. I like how some versions recorded it says they do not understand. For the truth of the matter is, it's not for lack of knowledge that we sin, but for lack of understanding the rippling ramifications of our sin. See, like Rebecca Pearson, many of us are making decisions that we believe are best for us given our pain, our fears, our decisions based on our understanding of safety, based on our understanding of love, our understanding of care. And the fact is, our ignorance to the generational impact of our choices is the greatest result of sin and it's the greater, greatest inflictor of pain. 
And so do we need to learn to forgive others? Absolutely. But it is when you understand that God has forgiven your sin because he understands your story that such a mental shift permits you to now forgive the sins of others when you learn their story. And as I think about this, I cannot help but remind you that forgiveness is an action. It's not a feeling. It's not an emotion. And so because in this moment, God's forgiveness looked like him taking on the sins of the world and then covering me in his blood, covering me in the brokenness, covering me in his, in, 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 in his torture. So that when he now pleads to the father on my behalf, the conversation goes, he's really looking at his son. He's not looking at me. If anything, he's seeing that as we talked about at prayer meeting that I am a broken human born and shaped in iniquity. I have a propensity towards something. I've got a bent towards something. I can't get rid of this thing and I need to be covered in the righteousness and the blood of Jesus Christ. So that if Jesus' forgiveness, if God is able to forgive me because God is looking at Christ and he's looking at Christ on me, the blood of Christ on me, the righteousness of Christ on me, then for me to forgive someone else means that I am making the active decision to see the blood of Christ on them. To see the righteousness of Christ on them. When they ask for forgiveness and when they don't. When they repent and when they don't. When they confess and when they don't. Because forgiveness is not about how I feel. Forgiveness is about what I do because of what has been done for me. And so this morning, I'm just grateful that there is a God in heaven who forgives sin. He forgives sin because he knows my story. A God in heaven who forgives my sin because he knows my brokenness is what's birthing my behavior. So truthfully, I really can't help it. Anytime I hear this hymn, I have to shout, oh, to grace. How great the debtor. Daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wonder. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart. Take and see. Seal it for thy courts above. I don't know about you, but if you need forgiveness for anything, (laughs) that's probably not even the right question. To everyone who needs forgiveness for something, I want to encourage you today that God, because of what he did on the cross, because of the prayer he pleaded unto God, desires that you be forgiven. That you do not stand accused. That you do not stand condemned or convicted. That is not God's plan for you. And so I pray in this moment that you, in your accepting of God's forgiveness, now learn to forgive yourself so that you might be able to forgive others. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, We are in desperate need of your forgiveness. Because God, we, in our ignorance, in our lack of knowledge, in our lack of understanding, in our attempts to do what we think is right, God, we hurt others and we hurt you. We crucify others and we crucify you again. 
And so right now, Lord, I ask, like your son, on behalf of your people, God, cleanse us. God, forgive us. Forgive us for the things that we know not that we're doing. Give us the grace that is your power to be able to walk and move as forgiven people. And so because we have been forgiven and because we have experienced your grace and we've experienced your mercy and we've experienced the goodness of God, May we extend that forgiveness and that mercy to others. May we extend that grace and that mercy to ourselves. It's in Jesus' name I pray this. Amen. What a word. 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 And, um, what an amazing thing that we have today, an opportunity to respond to this word that was preached about the forgiveness and really the grace of God. Uh, just a few moments ago, uh, we had a wonderful expression of this about how we're fully forgiven and fully loved by God in that of Brother Ken Dieterville uh, said yes to God. And so... We want to show the church family, the rest of the church family, what an amazing thing that was done today. Our gracious, loving Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for this very, very special moment. Lord, our brother Ken has made his decision to follow you all the way to make a public declaration of his desire, Lord, to be yours completely and to have you as not just a savior, but Lord of his life. So be with us now, God, in this precious moment. And thank you for the blessing of this family that has opened their pool, Peter's family, to us today for this baptism. Send your Holy Spirit right now into this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, this is the best that I have ever done. Jesus is the one coming Oh, this feels glorious. No sweeping does. Oh man, I might I might bike stroke after this. Yeah. Okay. What a joy and a blessing that is ours today, brother. Um, if you would just take my hand here, one under one over. Right there. And what we're going to do, Ken, is when I baptize you, if you would just bend your knees a little bit, and then you back where you back. I promise. <laughs> um, ladies and gentlemen, members of Emmanuel Brinko and all who see this, baptism is one of those special moments in a Christian's life when all of heaven stands at attention. Right now, your angel, the one that was dispatched and when you were born, is here. He's in this room. All of heaven rejoices, the Bible says, over one sinner that comes to repentance. And heaven is going to have a party tonight, today, because you, my brother, have made your decision to follow Jesus Christ. So can Because it is your desire to be baptized, and you have made that clear many, many times, it is an honor and a privilege to baptize you in the name of God, your Father, in the name of Jesus, his Son, your Savior, and in the name of the Holy Spirit, your power, who will empower you to be everything God has called you to be. Amen. Amen. Praise God in the body. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce you to the freshly minted baby from Brinklow, one of our
my newest babies. And I just thank God so much for this dear brother Ken. I love you, man. God bless you. Just keep walking with the Jesus that brought you through life. And he's gonna walk you. He is gonna walk you all the way home. God bless you. God bless you. That um, if there's anyone watching that wants to respond to this word of forgiveness, please, you can text 99000, this is us, no spaces, uh, and just let us know that you want to follow um, in this uh, sign of affirmation, of declaration about how much you love the Lord. And I hope during that sermon that you were using the QR code to take notes. I mean, I, you probably ran out of paper uh, from what was being shared today. So real quickly, before we get into discussion, don't go anywhere. We are not done because we got to talk about this. There's, there's some things that we, uh, you know, he said our needs go through Samaria. We need to talk about this, this word today. Doc Melly, just give like one thing that screamed at you from today's word. Only one? Well, God does yeah. not exhume my sins. Wow. Yeah, boy. Wow. Okay. Esmond, just, I, I know you can give five, ten, you have way with words, but just, just, let's stick with one right now. I got I, my notes right here. I know, but just All give right. one off of the notes. Forgetting, forgiving is choosing not to remember. Mm -hmm. Lord have mercy. Yeah. I'll stop right there. I, I think for me, um, the imagery of Jesus being on the cross mm. and being in pain, and, and having the presence of mind to push aside pain, look at people that are killing them, and talk to his father, who's not talking back to him at the time, and he says to his father, man, just forgive them. They don't, they don't, they don't understand what they're doing. That thing just got, got to me. So, Claudia, bishop, prophetess, priest, king, what, you know, whatever name I want to give, Lead us in this discussion today, because we got some stuff to talk about. Yeah, listen, so I guess, you know, what I would love to hear from, from you guys is what do you think is the thing that keeps us from being able to forgive? I in, knew you was going there. In this there. moment, Jesus I, is on the cross. He's being tortured. I don't think any of us have ever experienced crucifixion. And so whatever bad thing we've hmm. experienced pales in comparison to that and yet we are so quick we i am so quick to hold grudges to not be forgiving to be willing to just x people out of life and relationship and so i'd love to know what you guys think <laughs> keeps uh, people from forgiving all right i'm okay I, i'll be honest I, i'll be for me I don't want to say this, but, you know, everybody knows my stuff. It's power. It's control. You know, when, when somebody hurts me, I ain't, I ain't going to lie, and y'all don't make me feel like I'm, I'm alone. If somebody really hurts you, like for real, for real, you want to see done to them at the level or greater than the hurt they imposed on you. And I feel like Forgiving them is saying you don't need to feel the hurt you gave me. And I want to keep the control of the narrative of, <laughs> no, you got to get hurt too. And, 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 and it's frustrating that the gospel is not fair in that people can hurt you. And the grace of God says, even though they hurt you, I'm not going to hurt them like they hurt you. And I don't like that. So I don't be one to forgive. Well, I, you know, I, I agree with what Noah said. <laughs> so I, I think for me, the deeper the hurt, mm. the more challenging the pathway to forgiveness. And deep hurt for me comes from people you are close to, people you love, or folk you have gone out on a limb for. Mm. That, that, that creates that kind of deep hurt. And, and for me, you know, I almost wish I was just the hot-headed person who just explodes. 
Really? Because they seem to get over it faster. <laughs> is when you internalize and replay that hurt or replay how it happens over and over again, it deepens in me the inability to forgive because the pain takes precedence more than the pathway to forgiveness because you have internalized it so much more so. So, so it just creates a whole different Can dynamic. I ask a question yeah. or push him on that? Uh, I'm just, I thought Claudia something. was asking. Okay, go ahead. No, no, I'm no. just... Something you said triggered. I'm, okay. I'm triggered. Okay. No, I'm, I'm tri I feel like I'm in a therapy session. Y'all, like, y'all, y'all, this is us. Please, <laughs> please, get a, please get a couch right now. Yeah, I, yeah, I feel yeah, like yeah. I'm in therapy based on, because what you said triggered me in this regard. It, it's like when somebody hurts me and they are moving, they've moved on in life like everything's fine. So I'm mad at them that they're doing well. And I'm mad at myself that I have not moved on. You know what I'm saying? Like, so that's what triggered me for what you're saying. Yeah, you know, yeah. like, if somebody hurts you deep, it's like, dang, so, so you ain't get fired from your job or nothing happened. You, you ain't going to bankruptcy. You know what I'm saying? It's almost like they're doing better. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and I'm, yeah. I'm mad at myself right, that I'm right. so into how well they're doing that they move on and I haven't. You know what I'm saying? Sure, so I'm mad sure. at them and me. And, and, and then there's that conflict in you also. Because while I feel that way and want that for them, that negative outcome, the conflict is at the end of the day, I really don't. Ah. I want it, but I don't want it. I want I, it, but I want it. Yeah, but I want it. Pray for me. I, I want it because I want you to suffer but I don't want you to go through what I'm going through, even though I want you to go through what I'm going through. So it's that, for me, it's that, it's that conflict between that tug. I know better. That's the issue. Yeah, you know, because the Holy Spirit is still speaking. So it's the two I'm natures. Like, Hush. Yeah, it's like, the two natures yes. that are in conflict together is what I feel. Dwayne, what about you? Well, I, would, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think it, you wouldn't be human if you didn't feel this kind of pain when somebody hurts you. And I think for me, I would say my challenge comes that I feel like to forgive is to open a door to more pain. It's to, because for me to forgive, <laughs> then we got to talk it over. We got to deal with it again. So I figure if I don't close the door and I'm halfway moving on, Bruh, I'm, I'm not opening back up because I, I couldn't trust you with my heart the last time. So why would I trust you with it this time? I think that is an issue. But what God says to us is the peace of God that passes all understanding is the guard that is at your heart. Yeah. So even so to even what Dwayne is talking about, I'm going to go down the road. He just took a left on. Um, what then do we do with reconciliation? Does, does forgiveness mean that I have to be friends in contact with, connection to, in proximity? Do, must I reconcile with someone in order for forgiveness to take place? And yeah, we just had a benediction now. Do we yeah. have to answer this question? Made a, uh, real quick. May the Lord. Watch between <laughs> me and thee while we're absent one from another. Amen. God bless you as we continue to grow young and grow out. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think for me, um, let me start biblical. Please, first. please. Would you, would you start with the word? Can Elder, I start please? with the word? Can I start with the word? I, I'm thinking about the conflict between John, Mark, and Paul. Yes. Excellent. Uh, uh, of course, because, you know, Paul thought that John Mark abandoned him when he needed him the most. And they didn't reconcile. They went separate ways in ministry. They, sure did. they continued in ministry. It wasn't until years later was when Paul finally called for John Mark that we give the inkling of some kind of reconciliation. But what I get from the story is that the relationship changed. And, and reconciliation does not mean that we become what we used to be. 
it simply means that we have both accepted the grace of God. We've recognized the humanity, you know, because it's in the crises that the truth comes out. It's never, it's never in calm times. You want to know what a person really is like? It's in that crisis. Um, and it's those words and those actions that tell you so in that biblical story, they went separate ways, of course. You know, Barnabas was there to help and et cetera. But what, what ended up concluding the story was not that they didn't get back to where they were, but they were at a place that God had worked on both of them in their new endeavors. Yeah, in their new places. So, so I, I like that. That was, um, I, I guess, I, I, you know, that internal conflict you was talking about on the last one, that's, I have a lot of internal conflict about this. Mm. Because I used to feel, I'm, I'm not here anymore, but I used to feel like if I did not fully treat and was in relationship with that person like before, then maybe I haven't really forgiven them, right? So you gave your biblical example. This is the biblical example that came to my mind as soon as you asked the question. I'm thinking of Jesus, and I know he's the perfect example, but I'm thinking of Jesus. He had to be hurt on a deep level when Peter denied him. Absolutely. Right? On, on some of Christ's most intimate times on earth, it was always Peter, James, and John. He would call them in. Mount of Transfiguration, Garden of Gethsemane, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we know they were close. And, and so... Jesus had to be hurt, man. Especially with loudmouth Peter say, I'll never deny you. And he denied them. Right, right. And yet, when he rose, man, it was, it, it's almost like when reading scripture that Jesus treated Peter like they was before they had static, right? So I'm swinging between that pendulum and what you share, which mm. is, and I'm probably more on that line, when people hurt you, I think you can forgive them. I just don't know if you're able to be in relationship with them in the same way you were before. I'm uncomfortable with me, with, with you being able to forgive someone and not wanting to slash their tire anymore. Y'all ain't never, okay. <laughs> not want to slash their tire anymore or pour, pour hot water on them. Man, y'all are, y'all are too holy for me, Right? So you don't want to do that. You don't wish them ill, but you can be in relationship with them just not like you were before, like John Mark, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So in other words, and I'm, ta- I'm going to let you answer, Dwayne, you're suggesting that we cannot forgive like Christ forgives because Christ does not treat us differently. And he returns to the relationship, t- to the what some would call a toxic relationship. If I am the gomer of this story and I keep, I keep leaving, I keep doing whatever I want to do. And he, every time I come back, he takes me back. Every time I come back, he acts like I didn't leave any time before. I think we can. I think we can. But it goes back to what I said earlier, man. I want that power. I want that upper hand. It's going to take a lot, um, not on God's part, on mine, to be totally open to what he wants to do. I do think there are times when God is like, no, I don't want you to be in relationship with them anymore, you know, um, as you were. I, I do think there are times. But I do think, you know, he said, he said with him all things are possible. So is it possible? Based on scripture, yes. You asking me, is it possible? I don't know. I don't know. That's good. I think that's real talk. And um, I think in in the Christian journey, injury makes me, uh, my response to injury is a desire to be like Christ. But I'm not Christ. I'm trying to be Christ-like. Um, one is um, duplication, the other one is imitation. I'm attempting to imitate him, 
but he has he does have some capacities that are beyond us and we really need to be in relationship with Jesus and he walks with us through that so his response to Peter I think is at times at a different level than ours um, in, in, in some ways but let me say this man one of the things you know Pastor Medley and, and Pastor Noah mentioned um, you know in bi biblical examples this example of Paul and John Mark what's interesting to me about that thing is Paul's reputation was what Barnabas took on to bring him into ministry and when he turned his back on John Mark was it Barnabas I believe who said listen I'll take him yep. Paul had not yet learned the lesson of forgiveness that had been given to him and so what I, when I look at this thing and by the way, I'm in one of these situations right now with someone who is probably my, one of my closest friends. I'm in the situation right now. We are estranged. I just want to be surrendered to God enough so that if he says, Dwayne, make the first move, I make the move. Uh, but you also said something, Pastor Esmond, that about Christ, when we say we have to forgive like Christ. I agree. We are not Christ. So don't put me on the level of divinity when it comes to forgiveness. And I'm clear on that. And I, and I think we, we mistakenly say that. We have to forgive like Christ forgave. No, we, I can't. Because if I can do what Christ did, then I don't need a Christ. Uh, okay? So, so I want to be clear on the different level. So trying to imitate, I'm trying to imitate the characteristics of Christ that I can do on the human level because there are some things that only God can restore and forgive. There are some atrocities that have taken place uh, throughout society that are God-sized forgiven atrocities, hmm. not on the human level at all. I just want to be clear on that also. And on this whole journey, uh, Dwayne, you, 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 know, you talked about in personal conflict even now. I think where it manifests itself, and this is where I have my issue, where forgiveness has to manifest itself first, and Claudia, you may touch this because you're, this is us when you did the description, you know, we think about on the family level of how forgiveness has to take place. But I also thought that for us, the forgiveness in the context of a church requires it to be done in the public arena. And that also becomes equally challenging because everyone brings in their own brokenness of forgiveness and reconciliation into the mix. And it's out of our human brokenness that we want almost a Christ-like forgiveness from others who are in leadership role who are also human. So, yeah. And I was lit so I'm literally sitting here thinking about everything that you guys are saying. And I think one of the things I was thinking of is I agree with you. I don't think that I can, nor am I called to forgive to the level that Christ does because I don't have that ability. And on top of that, I think one of the things that I was thinking of as well is, I think the difference is God is perfect and God is good. And so while we might have a very one-sided relationship, once you put human bodies into the conversation, then you actually might not alter your behavior in any way, shape, or form. And so what I actually can't do is continue to put myself in a position where I'm going to consistently be harmed. And it is a very different conversation to where we're talking about there's a misunderstanding, there's a breach of trust maybe even, but once we're getting into to conversations about the fact that you are either emotionally or psychologically or physically or sexually, like, abusing me, then it's like, okay, I can forgive you. I need to forgive you. I'm called to forgive you. But I also have to remove myself from you. Absolutely. And that's okay, too. In order to forgive you. In order to forgive you. Now, the thought that came to my mind as well that I want to go to is 
Church hurt is also some of the deepest hurt that a person can ever experience. Particularly, I think, to kind of what you were talking about, Dr. Medley, in the sense that I think we all kind of come into this space with the expectation that even though everyone in here is human from the top all the way down, there's an expectation of righteousness that is not expected out every day when you go to school, you go to work, or you go wherever. And so when you then get hurt by somebody in here at any level, it feels almost like God is hurting me. So what do people do who the forgiveness journey that they're on, it's not with their family, it's not with a friend, it's not with an abuser, it's with the church. The forgiveness journey I'm on is with the church and with God. How do I forgive an institution? How do I forgive a denomination? How do I forgive pastors or preachers or lay people that look me side, side eyes? How do I forgive those people? May I suggest on this question? <laughs> um, my sister, you, that's a very deep question that you just asked. And I don't believe uh, that there's any, well, there, there's some hurt. Family hurt is probably deeper than, than church hurt. But church hurt, whew is got to be down there pretty deep because of the spiritual expectation. Um, the Bible gives us some guidance. There is a Matthew 18 model for church hurt, for hurt that happens among the brethren. And I would say it is, it is easy to move from personal hurt to corporate hurt. Very easy. You know, they did this to me, or it happened in this place. And, and so all of them. That, that happens when we hurt. It's a compensation mechanism, right? But I think what Scripture is trying to tell us to do is bring it back down to the personal, to the one-on-one. -on -one. Go to your brother. Take someone with you. Take the saints with you. So God is saying to us, I, even though there's this corporate structure, I still want you guys to work one-on-one -on -one where possible. And then seek the help of each other to bring about healing. But it's a very difficult, painful thing to do. And I, I want to add to that. Um, praise God for Christian therapists. Um, because there are levels of hurt that will always require professional Christian therapy. And there's someone watching us right now who is experiencing pain or things are coming up. Uh, don't be afraid, I pray, that you will seek out for professional help uh, because therapy is a much-needed requirement to deal with some pain, some hurts moving forward. Uh, so I have to say that. Uh, but adding to that, your, your, your issue about church hurt, and I agree with everything that's being said. I'm just adding to it. Uh, and I want to be clear on that. There's no conflict in our discussion. Just adding on. Uh, the other elements that come in church hurt is that when I think about um, Edwin Friedman's book on churches being, congregations being family systems, that it's in the context of the collective corporate body that you still have family systems sure. that are here. And that is the same way families successfully and unsuccessfully deal with hurts in their personal families. They transform, they transfer that onto how they deal with things in the church. And so individuals who are coming out of family hurt, in the context of the congregation, something will trigger. And to protect themselves, they project hurt on others. Dealing with your saying, because there's always a backstory. And it's, it's, out of the, it's out of the unresolved backstory that we get a lot of public uh, congregational hurts that take place, but there is a core root that we have not gotten to that has nothing to do mm. with the place, the congregation, or the person. It has something to do in their private worlds that haven't been resolved yet. You know, you know to, to that point, I tell, um, I tell couples this in premarital education that most people don't know how to have present arguments. And what I mean by that is 
when, when individuals get into communication conflict, it's really, it's often never about what's happening now, but it's often from experiences and conversations that happened before that were never resolved, right? So they don't know how to have present arguments. It's, it's, so I tell people, listen, let's first get an understanding of what we're in conflict about so that we're both in agreement, at least on what we're mad at, so that we're able to move forward. You know what I'm saying? Because you think we mad that we went to McDonald's and you was mad that we went to Wendy's. You, you understand what I'm saying? So I, I think it's difficult um, in church because, as you were saying, there is just a heightened expectation that, that how people function and act in the church is going to be different than in, in the public uh, spaces. So, you know, how do, how do those things get resolved? I, I don't know. I do think, though, that things can, can work out better um, if, if we just have an understanding more of who the other person is. You know, I think people don't seek to understand, but we are oftentimes so eager to get our point across that we never seek to understand what the other person is actually saying. And I think there could be some people in church who may be in conflict about something that happened 30 years ago that could be resolved in a five-minute conversation if they got understanding about what they really think the other person is mad at that they may not even be mad about. So, you know, and we sing when we all get to heaven and we, you know, I lift my hands in the sanctuary and we go through the motions when Scripture says... Leave your gift at the altar first. Just <laughs> come return your tithe and offering. Stop worshiping and just, just go talk to somebody outside. You know, and historically, I know in, in Adventism, you know, when we have communion once a quarter, at least this, this is how I grew up, and they would say, make sure, you know, we're having communion next week and make sure that you, you make your, your wrongs uh, right with everybody. But man, when I got older and I read scripture and scripture says, man, if you don't want to extend forgiveness to to somebody, then God wouldn't forgive you. Well, I can't have my, my, my prayers from God being held up until the next communion. You know what I'm saying? We're waiting until the next time that they announce communion, and so you go through a whole quarter of your prayers not being answered because you're just waiting for communion. You know what I mean? That's what we, you know, what we'll do. And so I think in church, as you were talking about the family systems, we just have to get a better or do a better job of being more intentional of understanding people. Yeah. You know what I mean? Most of us just know the church person, but we don't really know the person. You know what I mean? And so I think just seeking to understand who the person actually is um, and their journey that all of us have, that helps the reconciliation. Absolutely. So as we close, guys, I have one more question. I'd love for you guys to share practically what is something that somebody can do this week? Somebody who maybe is like Dwayne. I've, I'm estranged from a family member. I'm estranged from a friend. I'm estranged from the church. I'm, I'm maybe even estranged from myself. Maybe I can't forgive myself for some things that I've done, and I can't process through that. What is something that you would encourage somebody to do that can help them get into the position, get into actually executing the act of forgiveness? That, first of all, uh, let me just affirm one more time that your message today was absolutely a blessing. And I want to thank God for the woman of God and the plate that she served, God served through you today, was powerful. Um, in answer to that question, there are a couple of things. You know, Stephen looked at the example of Jesus. You said when you preached, he looked at the example of Jesus and he said, you know, the Holy Spirit filled him and he was able to extend forgiveness at the worst hour. I would say to someone, ask the Holy Spirit to make you willing. All right, don't, wow. don't, don't, don't go by that, that point. Don't try to just go reconcile. Mm. Just say, Lord, I'm not willing. Please help me to simply be 
willing. I surrender yes. my will to you, not to the other person. I surrender my will first and foremost to you. And I, and I would suggest one other thing. I would like you to take out a piece of paper. I would like you to go to that scriptural passage where Jesus is in Gethsemane and he says, not my will, thy will be done. And I would like you to do like you used to do when you were in grade school and the teacher said, get a piece of paper and write this five times. How many times did you have to do that growing up? Dude, I once had a hundred one she dropped on me for something I did in class. All right, yeah. I ain't going to ask them to do that. I'm going to just say, I would like for you each day this week to write that scripture out one time. In hand. Don't type it. Right. By hand. In cursive. I'm having PTSD right now with remembering the lines that you wrote. <laughs> you know what I mean? Y'all, y'all remember when you used to say, you know, you have to write, I will behave myself. And to speed it up, you would draw that long line and this just is, write the I. Okay, I'm this sorry. Is us. Just, this y'all is forgive us. me. This is us. So here's, here's what I was saying. Here's what I was saying. I got a resource some years ago that really blessed my life. Um, because I was, I was in conflict uh, with a family member with forgiveness, and it just um, it, it opened some things up about more myself. You know, we aren't just people that sin, but we're people that are sinned against. And um, a lot of times, I can't even get to I'm willing because there's some things that because of sins or w- wherever I, my journey has been, I'm not even able to get there that God has to get through. And so I read a wonderful resource years ago that has blessed my life. It's called Forgiving Our Parents, Forgiving Ourselves, Healing Adult Children of Dysfunctional Families. Beautiful resource that, that helped say, me. Say, say that again. Forgive it. Read that before you get to heaven. Forgiving Our Parents, Forgiving Ourselves, subtitle, um, Healing Adult Children of Dysfunctional Families. And in that book... Um, it kind of walks you through forgiveness and how you can help process, um, you know, through that because of emotions and and feelings that you have. Um, Because like I said earlier, man, when somebody hurts you, you want them to walk across the Atlantic Ocean barefoot, no, you know, or walk across the Sahara Desert, no water. You know, you want to see them done. And watch this. They can do all that stuff and you still hurt about what right. they did to you, right? right. right? So that's, that's what I would say. That's a very practical thing you can do. Go to Barnes and & Noble and, and just sit outside in, in the park one day and just help process and allow the Holy Spirit to get you to that level of, of being willing. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I, I would add to that. Uh, I'm thinking about Joseph. Um, Joseph healing his family helped to save a nation. Right, right. So, you know, there, there is something about family healing. And, and my counsel is this. Um, I got siblings and family members who watch us. And I've said to them, talking about forgiveness being, you know, an action, um, Let's stop talking about past hurts. We can acknowledge them, but let's stop talking about them. In fact, let's cast them, talk about today and tomorrow, and make that a part of the reconciliation. Um, it, It frees up because it says something about your own forgiveness, and it tells those who are closest to you. Okay, because your family is your family. Yeah. And um, Claudia, I know about the distance, about shutting down, not being around, not talking and so forth. But there's something about openly saying, I'm going to thrust myself back into healthy relationships with those God has given me. Because we can't choose our families. We can choose how we interact and involve with our family. And God will bless that relationship if we, if we do that. So I want to challenge those of you who are struggling. I'm starting with families. 
that you just make a commitment uh, not to be as historical, but to acknowledge what has happened, but determined by God's grace, you're going to move forward. You're going to move forward with them. And don't allow them to do it. Don't, don't, don't allow them to bring up out of the, their own guilt. Because sometimes we want to wallow in other people's guilt. No, you and God deal with that. I'm talking to you. I'm talking to my sibling. I'm talking to my parent. And I'm going to talk to you on that level only. Beautiful. Not about the yesterdays, but about today and our tomorrows. Beautiful. And God can do some wonderful things through that. Love that. I'm going to tell you what's so beautiful about um, what was shared. And then uh, especially you, Doc. In a few weeks, we're going to make a shift and a pivot in this This Is Us series to specifically deal with your family. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I, didn't, I didn't say why oh, you are Yo. Yo. What's that? You owe? You owe something? Yeah. Anyway. It's Ebonic. We is got he, it. We got okay. It. DC. <laughs> this is North us. East, this, this is us. Here we go again. <laughs> but we're going to pivot to help process some things through marriage, parenting, dating, even uh, divorce, all things. Uh, pertaining to families that you might be the families that God is calling for in these last days. And so please stay tuned. There's going to be some exciting things uh, in the second half of this series. But uh, before we end, Sister Claudia. Sister Claudia. Sister Allen. Sister Allen. Mother Allen. That's, that's mother, a real mother Allen. church. That's a church that's name. Church. Right we, mother, mother Allen. But you just dated her. You yeah, made her, I, I did, you made I did, her I did, 95 too. Don't did, put her out there. Dude. It's okay. okay. I genuinely am 87 in my spirit. Yeah, that's you are. 88. 88. <laughs> The Lord used you today Praise the in Lord. two ways. Number one, helping us to know and understand what God in Christ has done for us. Uh, beautiful segue from last night's communion and just releasing us. I mean, if anybody has or could say, I ain't going to forgive them, it's God, right? But, but time after time after time, do I have at least one witness yeah, watching now? Yeah, yeah. God's forgiveness just is, is really new every morning. And if God can do that for us, and why can't we do that for somebody else? Amen. You know, and Amen. that's what um, was such a blessing for, for today. If, if, if you know a family member, a friend, or somebody that you know needs this, please send them today's message that you would not be a word hoarder, but you would share it with somebody else, the great and wonderful things God has done uh, for you. Well, this is us. We're always out of time, never out of word, but we are so grateful and thankful that you have joined us for worship today. Don't miss Wednesday uh, as we talk about this is us as it relates to our health. Lord have mercy. I, I can't get nobody help in, in here today. Uh, yeah, you need to be there at eight o'clock as we continue our series. This is us. Thank you so much. Remember tomorrow's grocery grab and go a day. If you're able to help, if you're able to uh, be a part of that, please come out and be a blessing to somebody else. God bless you as we continue to grow young and grow out. God bless you. Stay tuned for Sabbath school. Yes, please stay tuned. In fact, you can go get a little biscuit, some chips, whatever you want, but don't go anywhere. As soon as we finish our, uh, our worship service here, Sabbath school is coming to you. Special, and listen, not just any presenters now. These, these, are the, these are the authors of this quarter's Sabbath school. How did we do that? How did we get the authors? I mean, bec- the- because we got the baddest Sabbath school superintendent in all of the world. Obviously. Uh, and but so- Gerald and, and Chantel wow. Flingbile are, are just tremendous presenters. They're all over the world, they've been this past quarter, and they're with us today. Right. They're with us. This is us. <laughs> Listen, in less than 30 minutes, don't go nowhere as uh, you receive the blessings of the day through Sabbath school. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you.